Okay, that is going to be a pretty intense book hangover, as well as maybe some really disturbing images that will stay with me for a while. I don't know if we're going full haunted, but we'll see. So probably unsurprisingly, I just finished Our Share of Night by Mariana Enriquez, translated by Megan McDowell. This has been one of my most anticipated reads probably for the year. Based on how much I love her short stories, both Things We Lost in the Fire and The Dangers of Smoking in Bed. And I definitely think that this will go back to those short stories, or I'll circle us back to those short stories here in a moment. But this is her first translated novel. And so we're moving from that real kind of system succinct short story structure into this much more sprawling thing. For instance, her first collection, Things We Lost in the Fire, is about that long, around 200 pages, and The Dangers of Smoking in Bed is about the same. Now, some of these stories are a little bit longer within this, but there is still that real specificity and succinctness and tightness to the storytelling within a short story form. So I was very interested to see how this storytelling I fell in love with became this almost epic of sorts at about 588 pages. And this follows a father and son in the first section which we will get into the structure of this shortly, as they are kind of on this quest. And the father Juan is taking Gaspar the son to the family home of Gaspar's recently deceased mother. And there is something dangerous lurking here. And it takes us a second to kind of build up to that. And I think that the atmosphere that Enriquez builds up is kind of her hallmark in a lot of ways. And a lot of things that both of her collections are exploring really come full circle in this novel. So Things We Lost in the Fire, her first collection translated into English and where I fell in love with her work is a really kind of insightful look at political horrors that turn incredibly personal. So we are looking at the political horrors of Argentina and the dictatorship and that disappeared through an incredibly personal lens. And I want to be clear that I don't know nearly enough about the political situation that permeates these novels, that seeps in to all of these stories, but that it, it is so incredibly clear within Enriquez's writing. And I just want to make that clear because I do want to be respectful to that because the weight is evident in this work. And so we move from that within Things We Lost in the Fire and The Dangers of Smoking in Bed were much more about the horrors of kind of coming of age. And they really kind of went back to that kind of time of adolescence and coming into one's own. And this novel really distills both of those and expands on both of those in really unique ways. And so when I introduced this book in the Anticipated for the Month, based on the blurb, I was really focused on this idea of Juan and Gaspar on this journey. And also how I felt like the structure of a journey would really serve something coming out of this short story format, that it would be kind of episodic episodic in a way, and also that I had a great sense of an odyssey almost to how the movement was going to work within this piece. And like when I read Dangers of Smoking in Bed, kind of expecting the same thematic explorations of things we lost in the fire, I was completely wrong. The kind of journey to everything was only the first section of this book. And it is the kind of overarching theme of this because the first section really focuses on Juan's desire to get Gaspar out from under control of this family and this family that is connected to this darkness, this darkness that Juan is also connected to and the cult around all of this. So it doesn't pull punches from the very beginning. And I say that with a slight caveat in that it takes us a little bit, like 50 pages or so, before we get to the real danger of the cult. But kind of discovering the cult is what I expected to be kind of the emotional and kind of climax period of the piece. And it wasn't. It really threw us into those horrors right away and the imagery that came with that and let us have to kind of sit with that and let the imagery that we had been introduced to there and the kind of things we knew were going on on the periphery kind of linger with us and haunt us as our characters were haunted by many things in this as well. So it kind of mirrored that experience for us. Additionally, while I was expecting this kind of structure of this journey, this odyssey, which implies a kind of linear journey in a lot of ways, that is not at all the structure of this piece. And in many ways, I think how it was structured 
probably unsurprisingly, because I am not the master of the kind of construction here, but serves something coming out of that short story tradition much better. Because we are separated into six sections that are kind of independent of each other, but also weave in and out of each other. And each section within itself is a fully contained story, technically. It has the structure of a short story, it has the rise and fall of the action, and it tells a complete piece. But we as readers are able to kind of get illumination to things from other periods, other sections, through the action of each section. And they are also very much connected to the main action. It's not like we're following different characters necessarily in each section. There are two sections that deviate a little bit more and show us a little bit more of a periphery outsider view to the action, but those also become a lot more clear in later sections or also help clarify things that have happened in sections before. And when I talk about this kind of linear structure or moving kind of linear through something, this both does and doesn't because we are kind of weaving in and out of time. We are not going straight forward but at the same time the action still does kind of move straight forward because we are really focused on Gaspar's journey and the kind of main three sections, the three kind of real forward momentum of the piece are following Gaspar from both his childhood in the first section when we see him with Juan, his later childhood in the middle section, the bad things about empty houses which I'm going to go back to more in depth shortly, and then his kind of early adulthood and the coming full circle of everything in the last section. And this all moves in a much different way than I anticipated, but at the same time is very much Enriquez's voice as I know it. She has a real slow and steady danger that permeates. She asks us as readers to kind of look at things we might consider normal at first with this kind of altered eye or things that we know are horrific, but kind of asks us to reframe or revisit or reconsider our compulsion to kind of view those things things. For instance, there's this extended section and metaphor kind of that's revisited of one of Gaspar's friends or his kind of friend group watching this young girl kind of trapped in this mud and rubble following a natural disaster and them kind of watching her slowly die over the course of days. Obviously there's also these layers of media ethics to it and there are layers of the personal and the political and the ethics of everything throughout. I'm always really compelled by the horrors that live on the periphery of Enriquez's work, and so while I say that I think it really does tap into the thematic explorations of both short story collections, I think I'm really personally responding the most to things that kind of mirror the explorations of things we lost in the fire. For instance, in the first section, and it's kind of barely touched on, but really sets a landscape, the kind of first tinges of the supernatural, of the otherworldly, of the macabre that we get are these echoes these ghosts that are never named as ghosts, but we get the sense of these people, these lost souls roaming the countryside, roaming the streets, roaming the cities. This idea that these are the ghosts or the echoes of the disappeared. We get this imagery of a man kind of crawling out of the water, and it's not dwelled on. These are not the horrors that Enriquez paints for us in the most detail, but they are some that stick with me the most. And it definitely explores this further in the novel, especially in terms of its themes, when it's looking at this kind of political upheaval, but also at how the family at the center of this story is so removed from all of this kind of unrest based on their class and their money, and how they are using people, how they are torturing people for their own gain, and how their ultimate goal is this desire for immortality, their belief that they are better than others and they deserve to be around and to stay around, and their belief that they are better than others kind of transcending into a lot of their awful acts. But it also kind of explores that decay and losing the sense of reality that comes with that search. Now there is that sense of the supernatural from the very beginning here. So we don't have that same question as we might in something like Mexican Gothic of whether our perception of reality is real. We always get the sense of the darkness and the evil here and it is very much described as a darkness. That is the active force of this supernatural world kind of bleeding into our own, but it is also exploring the hubris of these families, believing that they can control that darkness, believing that that darkness serves them in some ways, even as they are pantomiming these kind of rituals and these ceremonials that are in service to this darkness. And I think kind of one of the central theses of this was introduced very early on page 13 where it says, but it was old, and like all ancient things, it was voracious and wretched 
and covetous. And I also think that that is a great example of Enriquez's writing and what is so compelling about it. And it's interesting because I do not consider myself a horror fan. This is something that I was so intrigued by, but was also so disconcerting and so disgusting at many times. It really made me question what I could read and why I was able to keep going with certain sections, why I wasn't being haunted by some of these visions. And I also had this moment where I was like, this is so incredibly visceral. There are moments that are drawn so incredibly cinematically because it gives us these little flashes of these very descriptive pieces, but not in a way where it's not leaving these shadows of imagination to kind of make everything even more dangerous. The unknown and the questions that linger in that darkness is kind of the heart of horror. Horror at some level for me is kind of exploring the fear of loss of control in different ways. And this book kind of runs the full gamut of all of the ways we can lose control politically, personally, control of our body, control of our consciousness, control of our future, things that can grab you in the middle of the night, the things that can haunt your mind, those images that you're never going to be able to fully exercise. And I do want to caution you in that the imagery in this is dark and it is visceral. And so if that is something you don't want in your conscious, I would encourage you not to read this. I'm kind of constantly in awe that I have been able to read these works because I am so susceptible to scary things. And this is one of those works that I know I may love it in its book form, and I may be so compelled by the ideas, but the thought of this ever being translated to the screen I don't think I would ever be able to watch this because at the end of the day when I'm reading the book to a certain extent I can kind of control how much my brain is interacting with certain images. I can kind of control my environs and how I am interacting with the text. If this is on screen I am one very highly susceptible to mood music and sound design and it's going to build a different kind of anxiety. But I do think that the structure of the book is really smart and how the anxiety of these horrors ebbs and flows. It gives us these moments that are charged and violent and terrifying and then it kind of moves us back down and is exploring the aftermath of a lot of that. And so it's paced in a way that we're not kind of an anxious ball of nerves for the entire book, which I think is really important, especially because the book is pretty long. But the piece as a whole still has some of these overarching ideas and explorations. And I think one of those is definitely this idea of legacy, because the whole book is about kind of Juan trying to protect Gaspar from this legacy, and eventually Gaspar having to face this legacy and where that legacy finds him, even when he's unaware of it. And one of those places that this legacy finds him is in a haunted house in the neighborhood with his friends when he is a young boy. Now, there is a very specific timeline to this book, but I kind of had trouble keeping track of Gaspar's age throughout. It is what it is, but there are dates for each section. Now, there are time jumps within those sections, especially toward the end when we kind of follow Gaspar from where we left him off in this middle section to the end, but still there's some semblance to kind of root us somewhere. Now, in this middle section, I think this middle section is actually the heart of the thing, and I haven't read any interviews about how this came to be or where this stemmed from, but the middle section in this book is called The Bad Things About Empty Houses. And that kind of sparked something in my brain, but I kept reading. And within a couple of pages, we were introduced to a young girl named Adela. And that immediately finished the connection for me to Adela's house from Things We Lost in the Fire, which is the only kind of, to my recollection, real traditional haunted house story in this collection. And it follows a group of young kids that go into this house and how this house keeps Adela. Spoiler alert, but I don't tell you how it changes in our share of night because it does. The kind of narrator that is telling us this story in Adela's house, the short story, doesn't seem to be present. There is one other friend in the short story, Adela's house, Pablo, who is central to the friend group in our share of night as well. But it feels like this is kind of like the central thing. And I don't know where the germs of this book came from. Did we start with a kind of road trip with Juan and Gaspar? Did we start with Adela's house and this kind of middle section and these young children kind of bumbling against these larger forces and us as readers knowing that there are some outside force kind of playing into everything but not knowing exactly what. Additionally it's this idea of kids not having the full picture in a lot of ways. We see Juan here in this middle section and in the first section as very complicated and often abusive 
to gaspar. And it's this refrain that we often see from abusers of, I'm doing this because I love you. And as readers, we have a sense that there is some rhyme or reason to what Juan thinks he's doing to protect Gaspar here. But there are also moments of violence and abuse that are just unequivocally violence and abuse. And so in some ways, it's also looking at violence as intergenerational and how that horror is passed down, even if it is kind of this echo of the larger horrors of this cult and this power that Gaspar may have. So even while there is this noble kind of mission, there are really no heroes here because we see that anger and violence kind of go down the line. And we see a lot of these actions kind of born of selfishness and this desire to survive. And we have these characters, especially Gaspar and Juan, that are kind of removed from a lot of the everyday horrors of the people around them. In many ways, they are untouched by this political upheaval and the unknown there and the horrors there. That's not shied away from either and is kind of juxtaposed against this otherworldly horror. There is also a whole section that kind of talks about the after of some of these political horrors that is one of the kind of interconnectors of the main action and reveals some other things and then kind of winds into the end as well. And it's really masterful how a lot of this winds together, even if it can feel kind of disconnected initially and kind of meandering in some ways, but meandering in this kind of weird psychological nightmare kind of way. It almost feels more like a 19th century novel where you're kind of wandering back to places and people and themes introduced earlier and making sense of them in a way or picking up on things in a way that you really had no context for before. And in that way, the structure is extra interesting because we start right with this journey, this father and son odyssey of sorts, and then we wind from there. And that gives us some kind of semblance of what's going on. But then we see kind of Gaspar's kind of inciting incident. The inciting incident for his life is not that beginning journey. He doesn't really have recollection of that. And so we see those moments. And then we kind of circle back to Juan and Rosario's story from before. And we see them kind of coming of age in the 70s. And they're really kind of rooted in this rich kids occult counterculture from the time, except they have a real kind of tangible grasp on the occult. And so it shades everything a little differently. And I do think that the way that time kind of works here and the historical record kind of works here within the context of these really personal and supernatural journeys is also super interesting. For instance, there's a reference to this specific massacre that happens within this cult, which feels so gruesome and present and like like there will be larger reverberating consequences, which within this narrative there will, but within the larger world of things, it is overshadowed by other things going on in 1969, which was a very turbulent year in many, many ways. And so it's interesting to see kind of the way that things fold in on themselves within the narrative. And while there is this very present danger right in the forefront, it also lurks on the periphery in a lot of ways. It's like a really demented version of the bone clocks where we're trying to figure out where the danger is gonna jump out at us from. And it's a very slow and steady build to the point where when we get to the climax, it's like, oh, we're here and it's trying to kind of close the circle and it's a matter of how we're going to do it. And the way that it's done makes sense and feels inevitable in a lot of ways, but also to the point where to steal a line from Doyle from Angel, it's like, is that it? Are we done? And it's kind of hard. It feels like it moves a lot faster toward the end because before that we were moving so slow and we were so removed from the kind of cult side of things for so long because that was Juan's desire was to get Gaspar out from that. But we're looking at the kind of inevitability of those inheritances and how we do have to face off with them. And so even though the ending can feel a little rushed, especially in terms of Gaspar's grasping of his power or understanding of his power, because to a large extent, he doesn't still understand it. And to a large extent, as readers, I don't think we really understand it either. And I think Enriquez walks a very fine line or draws a very fine line to kind of fit within the context and the narrative here, because she has to make this world feel so present and active, especially when we're kind of in that flashback section with the parents, the chalk circle section, where we've got this more active seeking of this knowledge and these invocations and this exploring of this kind of occult dangerous 
side of things and seeing the violence and the horrors that come out of all of that. And then we have to take a step back. So we've got this sense of how some of this power works, but Gaspar has no clue. He hasn't been involved in that world. So it is a little bit more of a leap to kind of go there, even as all of these connections for things in his past are being put together for him and things are starting to make sense. And then things come to a head and we have to deal with them. So while the structure here was completely different than what I was expecting, it was still a wonderful evolution from the short stories that I love. And it makes sense within the context because like I said, each section kind of exists independently as a short story of sorts, even within this larger narrative where all of these threads are kind of interwoven and drop stitches get picked back up later. Go with the metaphor. I don't think it works perfectly, but that's also why I haven't completely a full scarf. So anyway, I think that this is a really great introduction to Enriquez's writing for those who have never read it. And I think for those who already love the short story collections, it's going to be an easy transition, especially because a lot of those thematic germs that exist in both The Dangers of Smoking in Bed and Things We Lost in the Fire are further built out here. But I also want to be clear that there is a lot of disturbing and macabre imagery here. And while I don't think it's necessarily going to give me nightmares or keep me up at night, if those are are images that you don't even want your brain to have access to, I would think about that before picking this up. However, if you are really intrigued by horror, I think this is a great place to go. I would probably classify it as literary horror, not to be pretentious, but because my kind of concept of throwing literary in front of any kind of like genre, literary romance, literary horror, literary fantasy, whatever, it is a kind of expectation for me as a reader that one, the language and the form of things may be a little bit more introspective, it may be a little bit more atmospheric, it may be a little bit more character focused versus plot focused, but also that it's not going to perfectly fit within genre conventions. Now, I don't admittedly really read a lot of horror, so I don't know all of the genre conventions, but honestly, that's part of why I would categorize it this way. But anyway, at the end of the day, this was a super compelling and disturbing and haunting read. Like with The Dangers of Smoking in Bed, I was not disappointed. My expectations were met, but they were also subverted in really interesting, engaging, and disturbing ways. If if you read this, I would love to hear your thoughts. There is so much to talk about here, so much to dig into, and we barely scratched the surface. So let me know what you're thinking if you've read this. Thanks for hanging out and listening to my thoughts. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. Read something good, and yeah, bye.